Okay, thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Uh, this webinar is creating a low-code IBMI web app in minutes with Nitro App Builder. I am Richard Malone, the CNX co-founder and managing partner. Uh, before uh, we get started into the, the meat of the presentation, I want to go over some housekeeping items. Uh, the first one is in the GoToWebinar control panel, you can submit your questions. So as I'm talking through things, if, if uh, something's not clear to you, you can submit them at any time during the presentation, and then at the very end, uh, I'll go through them all and uh, hopefully answer most of them. Uh, we're scheduled to go for an hour, but you know, this is, uh, this is live. I'm doing this live right now, so it could go short or it could go long. If you need to uh, leave, if we go long and you have to leave, the webinar is being recorded. And you will get a follow-up email soon after the webinar ends so that you can watch the webinar over again at your leisure. Also, I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this from downtown Chicago at the CNX office, so uh, you may hear a fire truck going by in the background or, uh, I don't know, somebody shouting on the sidewalk outside. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, make you aware that that could possibly happen. When you do this live, you know, anything can happen. So here we go. I'm going to go over... Um, just some very high level slides here before we actually do um, a live demo of creating an app. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen Valence before, you know, it's basically a suite of development and runtime software for all modern IBM I application needs. That's a pretty broad statement and it is a, a very broad functionality of the software overall and it's very difficult to go through all of it. So we're gonna really just focus on the Nitro App Builder today. But a few major points is that Valence is native to the IBM I, and all functionality is delivered via web services written predominantly in RPG. So Valence does not require any external servers, so everything you see today will be being served directly off IBM I natively. There's no uh, mysterious extra servers anywhere or any kind of uh, processing, intermediate processing going on. You just install Valence to your IBM I and you navigate to the URL to log in. So what's included with Valence? There's a lot of different things. The first one is the Valence portal, which manages the login and session management of everything and how you deploy applications to your users. Um, the picture here shows a, an example of the desktop portal. And we also have a mobile version as well available on the Apple App Store and Google Play for mobile devices. Uh, we have the Valence RPG Toolkit Nitro App Builder, which will be the focus of this webinar. So we're gonna you know, skip over that and come back to it. There's also these other things here too, which we really don't have time to cover, but I wanna just list them out so that you, know, you can see there's a wide breadth of different functionality. And I put a star next to Nitro App Builder because that is really one of the key items of Valence. It's what drives a lot of the Valence sales, the functionality of this App Builder. Um, and uh, so we really, you know, consider that the star of the product. The other things are all great and very helpful and necessary, but the Nitro App Builder really is the star of the Amazon. Okay, so a little bit about Nitro App Builder. What is it? You know, it's basically a low-code builder where you can create data-driven UI elements like charts, lists, and et cetera, that we call widgets with no programming required. Then you take those widgets and you combine them into a completed app. Now you then specify behaviors that define what happens when the user takes some kind of action, like when they click on something. And then when you're done creating these apps, you deploy them through the Valence portal. And those apps, when the user runs them, are interpreted by a runner. Okay. So uh, briefly, I wanna talk about what problems are we trying to solve with the Nitro App Builder? Like why we create something like this? Well, Valence has been out 10 years now, it, uh, version one came out in 2008, and we've learned over the years that companies feel like it takes far too long to create and deploy useful modern web and mobile apps to the IBM I users. So basically we like to say that businesses need to have their apps done in hours and days. We can no longer wait weeks, months, or years to get applications done like we did in the past. And also truly modern user interfaces require a really high skill set when coding them manually. And they do have quite a long learning curve to get good at it as a developer. Also good development resources are scarce or expensive. And so we need to do more with less resources. So that's why something like Nitro App Builder exists. Um, I'm gonna 
get to the demo shortly of the, the app builder, but I want to talk about the anatomy of how a Nitro app is structured because it'll help you understand it better once we get into the product. The core thing that you need to create first before you get started is a data source. That's just telling Nitro App Builder how to access your existing data tables on the IBM I database. So we define those first. And then to those data sources, we attach visual components, which we call widgets. In this example on the screen, we have a grid widget. You can also have something like a chart widget. And there's many other types of widgets. And multiple widgets can be attached to the same data source as shown. And you can also take those widgets and put them into a finished application. That's the simplest structure of uh, Nitro app. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can also have other data sources with different widgets attached to them all going into the same application. And widgets can also participate in multiple apps. For example, if you create a map widget uh, that shows customer locations, you don't want to have to create that widget in every single app you want to have a map widget in. You can have the same map widget participate in many apps. Okay. And we'll rearrange this here to talk about behaviors. So you also define behaviors, which are like user actions. So for example, a behavior could be if a row on a chart widget is clicked, then update the grid widget, like filter that grid widget. Also, you could do something like if a row on the grid widget is clicked, maybe we're updating a map widget. And you'll actually see that in our demo today. You can also do things like if a button is pressed on the grid widget, then call an RPG program to perform a special task. Okay, now it's demo time. So here I'm at the Valence Portal login screen, and I'm just going to log in. Okay, so I have a lot of different things here I can do within Valence. I'm in, you know, I've signed in as QSEC off, I have access to everything. You'll see something similar if you install Valence on your system for the first time. But we're focused on just a couple things for this webinar. We're focused on the Nitro App Builder. And also, we want to take a look at this customer dashboard under the Nitro App Builder example section. I don't have time to go in and show you all of these different examples that are all done with Nitro App Builder. We're just going to focus on this customer dashboard. And we're going to go through and recreate that from scratch. Um, so, if you like what you see in this webinar, I would strongly encourage you to install Valence on your system and go through all of these apps and explore them and explore how they're created. But let me launch the customer dashboard. This is the completed one. That's with, this is our goal is to recreate this app from scratch so you can see how it's done. So when I launch it, I first have a pie chart on the left side that lists all the, all the countries where I have the top number of customers in. And the chart on the right side is, is the same data, but it's shown differently. These actually use the same data source, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and they're listed in uh, descending order from the, the country with the top number of customers first, and then descending order. So if I click on a country, let's say I click on Germany, what I'll get here is a map of all the customer locations in Germany. And I also, get, I also get a count over here. We call this key performance indicators, these little squares that you can put on the screen. So we have a total number of customers in Germany, and we have a total number of sales dollars in the database for customers in Germany. Um, that, that's pretty much the extent of the app. Oh, you can also click on these little markers here, and it'll show the, the customer name. So when you click on the marker, you can configure that to show all kinds of different data. But for here in this example, we just have it a simple one just showing the name. Uh, this is using the Google API, which is a built-in grid widget or a built-in widget uh, that's used to, or delivered with Valence. Um, and that's pretty much it. You can go and just click on, I'll, I'll click on another country and you can see and it'll just update the map and it'll update these numbers over here, go back and forth. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually go into the Nitro app builder. I'm going to recreate this from scratch. I'm going to build it in phases. So that you can see just this pie chart and the grid first without, without being able to click to go to the next step of the map, and then we'll add the map later. So we'll build it in phases because that's actually how you would create an app normally, right? You put a little bit of, you put a little bit of functionality into it, you test it out, make sure it works, and then you move forward and you keep adding bits, bits to it. So I'm going to leave 
this open for reference customer dashboard example, and I'm going to click the valence icon to go back to the launch pad. We call this the launch pad. And now I'm going to go into Nitro App Builder. <clears throat> now I don't, I'm not showing anything in here right now. Remember we talked about um, the anatomy of a Nitro app. We have data sources and widgets. Those live in here. And then we have apps. Those live in here. And you can see I don't have anything. So you would say, well, where are the examples at? You have to click this little cog wheel and click show examples. So if you get balance loaded on your system, you'll have to remember to do this if you want to see how they're created. When you click show examples, now you can see all of the data sources and widgets and the individual apps. This view is a little bit cleaner to look at. If we, here's our customer dashboard app and we can open it up and see all the different components. These are the different widgets that belong to that app. And if we open it up further, you can see which data source it's connected to. Um, so that's how you get to the examples. I'm gonna actually turn them off so that I can have a clean slate and the things that I create for this webinar, um, you know, will be the only things in the list for clarity. So remember the first thing we start with is a data source. And I'm gonna create the data source that is gonna feed that initial pie chart and grid with the top customers. So I click add data source. <clears throat> and then the file that we're gonna go after is demo CMAST. So we're gonna add that to the list. By the way, this is a little wizard. It's bringing me through to configure my data. I could also enter a free format SQL statement and I will actually show you that on a different, on a different data source, but not this one. We'll, we'll make this one the easy one. So the columns we're gonna show on this one are the country, and we're also gonna count the countries, all right? And then we're gonna group by the country. And let me take a look at the preview of the data. And you can see now I have all the different countries, and we have the count for each country. But remember, I wanted them in descending order. I want the top countries to come in first. So let me go back to order by, and then we'll take the top countries, or we'll order by the count, and then we'll click the direction and make that descending. So if I go back to preview, now you can see that I have my top countries, United States being first, and then Germany, France, et cetera. So let me save this data source. And I'm just going to call it CUS Top Countries. And I'm going to put a tag on this called Webinar just to make it easy to find, although I don't have anything else in my list. Um, I just want to show you this tag functionality. You can put multiple tags on things to help find your components easier down the line. Okay, so now we have this Top Countries data source. Now I need to connect a widget to it. Remember, that's the next step. When you have a data source, those feed into widgets. So I can click the data source and do create widget. Now the first widget I'm gonna do is that pie chart here. And now I can click the data field is the count and the label field is the country. So whatever my data source is, this is gonna feed into these lists and I just choose them like that. I'm gonna limit my results. You see all of these small slivers here with countries that may only have one or two customers. I want to limit my results to the top eight. That'll help me uh, only show the countries that are really important and make the pie look a lot cleaner. Also, some of the countries are getting cut off here because there's not enough space around the pie chart, so I can manipulate that on the UI area here. I can, I like to add a little donut shape that makes the, the pie chart look nicer where you put a little hole in the center. And then if you add padding around the outside, that gives it enough room for the country names to sort of flow around the outside of it. Okay, so that's really all I need to do to this one. And I'm gonna save this. And I'm gonna call this uh, Top Countries Pi. And we'll tag that as a webinar. Okay, so now we have our data source and we have one widget attached to it, and you can see that in sort of a hierarchy here. Now, let's, let's take a look back at our, this is, the, this is what we're shooting for. This is the completed app that we're going for. There's a pie on the left, and then there's a grid or a list on the right. So let's go back and create this list. We have a pie now, 
Now we're going to create this list. So I'll create a widget from the same, this is coming from the same data source, and then we're going to create a grid. Okay, so we're going to choose the count and the country. As soon as I start choosing uh, columns, you'll see a little uh, preview come up along the bottom, and I can actually raise it up a little bit to get a better feel for what it's going to look like. Okay, I want the country to be first, and then the number second. So I can actually pick this up and drag it. And then once I do something like that, you can see it shift down here. I also want to give the width of the columns equal weight. These numbers are sort of a weighting scale. So half of the, half of the space available will go to the country and half will go to the, the number. I'm going to center the number. There we go. And then I can also change the titles. Uh, I don't want this long title, which actually comes from the database field. I just wanted to say country and number of customers. Okay, so that looks pretty good to me. I am gonna go ahead and save that. I don't think there's anything else I wanna change. Oh yeah, there is one thing I wanna change. You see by default, because this is a grid, I'm getting a paging toolbar on the bottom. This list is not gonna be that long, so I really don't need that paging toolbar. So I'm gonna turn that off and that's done over here. You can also see while I'm in here, there's many other there's many other functions here you can change, uh, many of which we don't have time to go into on this webinar, but you can easily add a download to this list, to, to an Excel download, and, uh, and many other ways to enhance this and, and, and give it more functionality. So we'll call this one Top Countries List. Okay, now I, I have enough now to begin putting my app together. So I have the data source, and I have two widgets attached to it. That sort of makes up my first uh, visual view of the application. So now I can go into the app section and hit the plus sign to create a new app. And now the first thing it's asking me for is I have to, the minimum that you, you need to put in an app is at least one widget. So I'm going to put the pie in first. These are the widgets that are available. So it's building. Now this is sort of like my canvas, right? This is what the app is going to look like to the user in this area here. And I'm going to add another widget, and that's the only one left in my list is the top countries uh, list. And now I can use these arrows to move them around. By default, they're just going from sort of top to bottom. But I want to use this arrow to bring it up next to the pie chart. So now these are living next to each other. And I want to try to keep the space around the outside of these widgets the same. So I can use this little cogwheel here to adjust the margins around. So on the right side of this one, I'm going to just lower this margin a little bit. And then on the left side of this one, I'm going to lower this margin down a little bit as well. So now you can see there's equal number of space around these widgets. Um, I also want to make, I want to give more space to the pie widget because if I, if I flip back here, to the example, we're giving about two thirds of the width of the screen to the pie chart and about one third of the width to the grid. So I can, I can handle that easily here by just adjusting this width of the pie chart. So now you can see I've given more width of that so it automatically takes over more space and makes this list a smaller width. Okay. So now I can save that configuration, and now I'm going to save this app for the first time. And what I'm getting is it's asking me for the app name. I'm going to actually cancel this for a second and give my app an app bar title. This is just the title that will exist at the top of the app. And I'm just going to put, uh, call it customer dashboard. And just so it doesn't have the same name as another app, I'm going to call it Cust Dashboard Webinar. So I can recognize it easier as compared to the default one that's included with Valence. Okay, so now if I save that, it's giving me a suggested name for the app as the same thing that I put in the title. Now, uh, this panel is mostly asking you about portal information. How do you want this app deployed in the Valence portal? Um, do you want it in a particular category on the launch pad? I'm just going to leave it nine categorized for now. 
and you can also deploy it, choose to deploy it to a desktop or a mobile devices. And I'll just leave the defaults. And also, uh, role-based security is also included in here. I'm just going to deploy to all, all groups, uh, but you could limit the access to this based on group membership. That, that gets more into the valence portal, so I won't talk about that in too much detail. So as soon as I save this, now when I go back to my valence launchpad, I should see the app on the launchpad, and there it is. So in just that few amount of minutes there, I was able to create just the basics of this customer dashboard app. So let's launch it and make sure it works. And yes, there it is. Okay, so I have my pie chart on the left, my grid on the right, looks perfect. Now, when I click on something here, like the example app, if I clicked on Germany, I would get a map of all the customers in Germany. We have not added that yet. So the next phase of this is we are going to go ahead and add that map. So I'll go back to the Nitro App Builder. I'm going to go back to Data Sources and Widgets, and I'm going to add a new data source for the mapping information. And really, really all I want to do is just get all the customer data. And I think in this case, I'm going to enter a free form SQL statement. So this is the, by default, it's going to take me through the wizard and ask me all these different questions about how I want to access the data. But optionally, I can enter a free format SQL statement. So for this one, I could just go ahead and do select all from all of that here. And I also, but I also could use this little helper window over here and say the file I want to get columns from is demo C mask. And if I look up that file, it'll actually give me all of the fields in that file. And I can so click select all and add the file. And now it'll build this SQL statement for me over here automatically. And I can go and manipulate this by hand. Um, it, this is really helpful because, like, for example, if I, if I unclick this field, notice it'll, it'll come in and out of the statement over here. And if I type something by hand, then it will also add over there. Anything that I change on one side affects the other side. So that's, that's kind of a nice feature. Um, I'll just preview this simple statement. And by the way, it can be as a very complex SQL statement. We have many customers that join lots of files and do uh, really very complex SQL statements, and they work really well. But for this webinar, of course, we're going to keep it simple. Um, okay, so here is the preview of the data coming through. I'm just going to go back and maybe add an order by. I don't think it's necessary for the app, but um, I'm going to put it in anyway because our example has that. So now we're ordering by the name. Okay, so let's save that. And we're just going to call this all customers. This is customers all. Just essentially a data source of all customers. Now, what we want to do is we want to add the map to that data source. So we're going to do a create widget, and here's the map. Okay, now you're going to choose columns from the data source that are required by the Google Maps API. So like think about how you would enter in an address in Google Maps, like what would you type? And you know, it's pretty easy. We're just going to do uh, the address I'm going to look at my example really quick here. <clears throat> We're just going to do the address, line one, the city, the state, and the country. Okay, We're just going to feed that into the Google Maps API. And in the preview here, we're limiting this to just four markers, just as an example. But when we actually run this widget in the app, you know, we're going to actually get the data from the country that we selected. Okay. So now you can choose a, uh, something to show on the marker for when you click on the marker, and we'll just show the customer name. That's what our. But you could add the the full address or any other, any other information you want to come up when you actually click on the marker. Okay. And so we'll save this. And we'll call this uh, this map. Okay, so now we have a map attached to the customer's data source. So now we can go back to the final app and add that widget into our app. So this is our customer dashboard. 
So now I'm going to talk about a concept called app section. So when I first launched the app, every app has a main section called a section called main, and that's what comes up when you first launch the app. So we're going to add a new section that we can go to when the user takes an action, and we'll just call it uh, we'll call it country. That's the that's the section that's going to contain the widgets that have this country specific information. Okay. So when, now that I'm in the country section, I have like a new blank canvas that I can add more widgets to. So we'll add widget. The only other, the only widget available that I have not have part of this app already is the customer map. So we'll add that in. Okay. Now I'm gonna, I'm just gonna save this. All right. And then just show you when I go back into the app and refresh it. I'm going to close the app and just relaunch it again. <clears throat> Nothing happens, right? So I haven't told the app builder yet how to get to the map. Okay, so I'm going to go put that behavior in now. Okay. So when I go back to the app, you see this button up here called behaviors? Okay, I'm going to go into behaviors and so what th this is basically a structure of how the, the, the app looks. I have the application level and I can add sort of user actions against different areas of the app. So the first thing I want to do is let, let's take a look at our example. The first thing I want to do is when the user clicks on one of these pie segments, I want to go to the map to show the countries on the map. Okay. So I have to start with, well, what is the user going to take an action on? Well, it's going to be this, this uh, top country's pie chart. So right now, when the user clicks on the chart, what happens? Nothing. There's no action. So I can add an action to this, and what I'm going to do is filter a widget. Okay? So I'm going to filter a widget, and what, what widget am I going to filter? I'm going to filter the customer map. Okay? And how are the date, how is the data related between the widget that I'm coming from, the pie chart, and the widget that I'm trying to filter, which is the map, and it's related by country. So I click the relationship is country on the left and then country on the right. So here's the relationship here. I can click multiple fields if the relationship involves more than one field, but in this case it is it is just one. Okay, so that's all I need to do for that. I'm gonna save that. Also, I need to tell so I filtered the data in the widget, but I didn't tell the system to show the, the, the map. So I have to do that by doing hide show widgets. So also when I click on the chart, I want to activate this thing called hide show widgets. So I want to hide the main section and I want to show the country section. You see that? So when I save this, so now I have this uh, configuration here called hide show widgets and I can see here, that the main section will be hidden and the country section will be shown. So now when I look under the chart click, I can see a list of everything that is going to happen when that chart is clicked. All right. So let's save that and see how it works. Okay, there's a shortcut for reloading this app. If you just right click somewhere in the app in Google Chrome, there's a thing called reload frame and that will sort of relaunch the application. Okay, now when I click on, click on a country, it will limit to just that country's markers, okay, on the map. Pretty cool, huh? Ah, but look, I forgot something. Uh, actually, it was intentional, I didn't forget it. <laughs> so I've gone to the map, but I didn't give myself a way to go back, right? So I have to go and put a button or some other kind of control that will help me get back to the main section. So one, now the way it is, once I get into this country section that's showing the map, there's no way for me to get back. So let's take a look at that. So we'll go back into the app. And we'll go back into behaviors. And when I go, now when I'm in the country section, there's this little plus sign here in the country section and it'll allow me to add a button, okay? So let me find a, a button uh, that would be appropriate for back as sort of like a left arrow, right? So there's like a left arrow. 
And I don't even need any button text on it because it'll be obvious to the user that the left arrow uh, will mean to go back. Also, the position of the arrow should be on the left uh, because it, it's more natural for a back button to be on the left. So we'll save that. Now, I got a big red warning here because look, I put a button onto the app, but I didn't tell it what the button should do. The app does not know just because I put a left arrow button that it means to go back. So I have to actually tell that button what to do. So when that button is clicked, I need to do tie show widgets. And in this case, I'm going to re-show the main section and hide the country section, okay? And I can see that here. I'm hiding, let me just double check that. I'm hiding the country section. I'm showing the main section when this back arrow is clicked. So let's see if that works. I'm gonna relaunch the app again. All right, moment of truth. Okay, there we go, I can see it already. So there's my back arrow. Now when I click it, and it works, great. And if I, I can go to a different country, and now I see all of the markers for that country, and uh, then I can keep going back and forth. All right, so great. Now you can see it's only been, I mean, I talked for about 10 minutes before we got started in the app, so it's been about 22, 25 minutes, and already I have a fairly useful app, okay? And uh, you can see you can keep on going and, and add many more things to it. Um, let's take a look at our original example and let's see what we're still missing. This is the original completed app that I'm going into. So when I click on this, on this app, I have, I have the countries on a map here. And I also have these things on the right called key performance indicators. Okay, so let's go ahead and add these as well. Now, these two uh, will take a little bit of time to create. I need to create uh, individual data sources for both of these. And this one in particular is gonna require joining three files together and doing a, a summary calculation uh, to, get, to get this number. This is total sales for the particular country that you've clicked on. So let's go back and take care of that. <clears throat> so I'll go back to Nitro App Builder. I'm going back to data sources and widgets. This is everything that's part of my app now, and I'm gonna create another new data source. So the first one we'll create is a customer count. This is actually a very easy one. This is the total customer count. So we're gonna go back to our demo customer master file, and then uh, we're gonna pick the column, the count column, and that is really all we need to do. If I can jump right to preview, the total number of customers is 210 customers. That's, that's the only thing I need from that file. So we'll just save that. Okay, and there's a customer count. And while I'm in here, I'm just gonna put the key performance indicator widget right on there. So we'll create the widget. And single KPI, that's what gives us that little square with a, just a simple number in it. Great for dashboards. So single KPI, uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna put total customers as the label. And then we're gonna choose, we only have one column in, a, in the data source we're connected to and that's just the count. So you'll see that come out. Total customers, 210. Now in my example, the 210 was blue. It looked a little bit nicer. So if I jump over to colors and I can choose a different background color and then if I jump back here, you can see now it has that nice blue color to it. Okay. So we'll go ahead and save that. <clears throat> so we'll call that the customer count. KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator. Okay. So there it is. Now I'm going to go ahead and create my data source for getting the total sales. Now I'm gonna do three files. All right, now bear with me here. This could be a little tedious. So I'm gonna start by adding the demo CMAST file, okay? And now there's two other files. There's an order file, which has a header file, and it has the, a detail file. The numbers that we need, the order quantities and the prices that we need to calculate a total uh, dollar amount are in the detail file, but we can't link to it directly to the customer master file. 
we have to go through the header file. So we have to first link the header file by customer number and then to the detail file by order. So I'm going to do demo org H is the header file. So we're going to add that one. And then demo org D is the detail file. Now when I go to file joins, now uh, this is the first time you're seeing this, but it's pretty simple. I have to join the main file, which is the customer master file, to the order header file. So, and that's mapped very simply. The from field is the customer in the one file, and then to the customer in the two files. So it's just linked by customer number. And the mapping for the detail file over here is by order number. So I can link the order number in one file to the order number in the other file. It's just that simple. Now, the columns that I'm, I, I don't want any of the columns from any of the three files by themselves. I want to have a calculated column. So you do that by, you go over here and say add a calculation, all right? And we're just gonna call this total. And we'll give it a label of total sales. And now here would be sort of the equation, and this follows SQL rules. Uh, but there's a little helper thing here where you can just sort of find the, the field that you're looking for and click on it. So I'm looking for the detail file has an order quantity and the price. And what I want, so I'm just, I clicked on both of those so that the field names would come in here, but what I want to do is sum the order quantity times the price. So if I save that, I should get the total sales numbers there. Okay, perfect. And I don't think I need to do anything else other than hit preview and just see what we get. Now uh, that's gonna be the total sales for all orders, for all customers in the entire database. But when we, when we click on a country, we're gonna specify the filter widget to filter it by just those countries that we've clicked on. But for now, this, that looks right to me and we'll go ahead and save this. All this plus sales. Okay, so we'll save that. All right, so there's the customer sales data source. And now we're going to put a key performance indicator on that right away. Okay, so we're going to put uh, total sales. And then the only column that we have in the data source is just that total. And just like the other one, we're going to make that blue. So we'll go back and take a look at it. Um, oh, I want to, you know, this is a dollar amount, so I can configure it with this little cog wheel here. I can choose a formatting option. And that's, I know that's money, US money, so we'll choose that one. And wait a moment for it to repaint. Okay, that looks good to me. So we'll go ahead and save this one. Call that cuss sales key performance indicator. Okay, all right, so I've successfully created two new data sources and two new widgets. Now we can go back into our app and wire this all up. So this is gonna be an interesting one. Remember now, I wanna add this to the country section, so I'll jump into the country section. The only thing I have in here now is my map. And I want to put those key performance indicators over here on the right. And so I'm going to add a new widget. And I don't want to just add these widgets directly because I want a finer level of control as to how they're displayed vertically. And we have this thing called utility widgets. And there's something called a vertical layout, which is really just a container. And when I put things in that container, they will naturally lay themselves out vertically from top to bottom. <clears throat> so I'm going to click on that. And we'll just give this a name for reference. That's where we're going to put our key performance indicators. So I'm just going to call it KPIs. And there it is. So the utility widget automatically comes in the bottom. I'm going to move it up so that it's on the right. I'm also going to increase the width of the map because if you look in our example here of the finished app, I have the map taking up two thirds and the key performance indicators taking up about one third. So we'll do that. That's what it looks like we have here. And now into this vertical layout widget, I'm gonna add my key performance indicators. I think we had the count on the top. That's the first one. And then we're gonna to add another one. 
sales. Okay. Now, I'm going to spend just a moment here to make sure that I have the correct width between all of these. Um, on my map, on the right side of my map, I only want to put the 8 pixel margin. And then on these uh, key performance indicators, on the left side, I want to put an 8 pixel margin. And on the bottom, I want to put an 8 pixel margin. This doesn't take a lot of explaining. It just uh, we just want to make sure that we have an equal amount of space around all of the widgets. So when you add all this up the way I'm doing it, you should have an equal amount of space. Okay. So now that looks visually correct to me, but what we need to do is we need to go back into our behaviors and specify that these new widgets should be filtered by the country when we click on the country pie chart. So I'm going to go back into behaviors and see when we click on the pie chart, <clears throat> we already have the customer map being filtered and we're hiding and showing the correct sections. But we also have to filter those key performance indicators. So I'm going to add those filters now. So filter widget, we're going to filter the count widget by the country, same as we did for the map. Okay, so we'll save that. And we're going to filter the other widget. <clears throat> Sales by country. OK, so now you can see we're filtering the count widget and the sales widget. And now let's see if this works. Hopefully I didn't forget anything. But if I did, we can go back and fix it easy enough. So I'm going to refresh the application. And if I click on one of the countries, all right, awesome. Looks excellent. So I would say that was about 30 minutes to create that application from scratch. Now, of course, I've, I've done this application before, and I've got, I can go pretty fast at it. But you, know, you get the idea in a matter of this was the first time you were creating this app, and you needed to really figure out the data and how you were going to do the the data sources and whatnot. It might take you like an hour or two at the most. And you can deploy this to your end users and it'd be highly functional. Um, so that is that is uh, the demonstration of creating an app. And I'm just gonna go through and um, take a look at the original and make sure I didn't forget anything. Oh, in the original app, what I had, so you can click over here on the pie chart to get to a country, but you can also click over here on the list. In the one that we created, if I go back to the one we created, I can click on the pie chart and get to here, but if I click on the grid, I can't get anywhere. And why not? Well, it's because I didn't define those behaviors for this grid. But the reality is the behaviors for this grid are the same exact behaviors that we put on the pie chart. So it's a, a trivial exercise to add the same exact behaviors to the grid, so we won't cover that in, in this webinar. I'm going to jump back to my PowerPoint presentation and go, go through a few more things here that you might find helpful if I can restart this exactly where I left off. Okay, I want to spend just a minute talking about what developers think of Nitro App Builder. Um, in its current form, Nitro App Builder has been out for a couple of years. And uh, we we talk to developers and get a lot of feedback from them. And I just recently put out a blog post on on this yesterday. But basically, sometimes developers think you know the tool is basically going to take over their job. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to uh, talk about this a little bit and and tell you what our findings have been. You know, essentially, Nitro App Builder it's not going to take over your job, but it's 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 basically going to change your job a little bit. Remember. We used to call it, uh, developers on IBM I programmer analysts with, uh, and focus uh, in my discussion on analysts. So it still takes a developer to do good analysis and to understand your business in order to be able to create applications. Um, also, developers are concerned that uh, they won't have fine control over those uh, little details anymore. Um, but the reality is that when you're able to get really useful apps out to your users really quickly. 
that becomes much less important. And you can see the user interface that Nitro App Builder creates is really good. So we don't really run into cases a lot where users and users are concerned about those fine little details. Um, you know, this is a funny one because you can create applications so fast with Nitro App Builder, you know, uh, this is sort of tongue in cheek that, you know, what are developers supposed to do? Work a day, you know, and take nine days off. If something used to take you 10 days to do that you can do in one day, you know, what are you going to do for the other nine days? Well, you know, the reality is that if you can do work faster, you're just going to have more work to do. So your workload will not decrease. That is our experience. You're just going to be able to produce a lot more apps and a lot more useful stuff for your end users. And your users are going to be so much more happy. We've seen this time and time again with customers where when, you, when the users start getting apps, they just ask for more. The reason that users don't ask for a lot is because they know you're busy and you know they've already asked you for so many things they haven't gotten so they don't ask, but when you start delivering things quicker, they just ask for more so that you can really leverage your experience to do much more for your end users. Um, and last, you know, like it's, this is a control thing. You know, my users are very picky and trust me, your users will be very happy that you're delivering to them what they asked for, you know, much faster. And if you really need to do an application manually to give them something in the fine detail that Nitro App Builder cannot do, at least you can develop a Nitro app for them immediately and give them something useful while they're waiting for the other app. We've, we've done this before as well. So that is sort of like a scenario that you can, uh, you can work toward. Okay, I just wanna mention, I'm gonna take questions in a moment, but I just wanna mention ways that you can engage with CNX. Um, how customers can move forward with using Nitro App Builder. You can essentially do everything on your own. We do recommend a two-day uh, training course called VV100. That's Nitro App Builder training. It's a two-day training class that you can take here at CNX Chicago offices, or we can sometimes even do it online, but we, we, you know, we uh, rather do it in person. Um, you could continue working on Nitro App Builder apps mostly on your own and ask CNX for help when needed. You can also engage CNX in professional mentoring, and I put here it's very successful because we've had a lot of good success stories with this. So professional mentoring is sort of like doing things on your own and asking for CNX for help when needed, but it's more formalized. So if you have apps to work on, you know, you can work on them mostly on your own, but we can have weekly meetings with CNX and we can sort of mentor you through the process. The learning curve by doing that is very short, plus you know you're getting feedback from the professionals here at CNX to know that you're using best practices and doing things the right way. And essentially what we see is you might use a lot of mentoring in the beginning, but then it sort of tapers off as time goes on. And if we make that very simple for you to use, we just charge you by the hour. And there's no minimum or anything like that. The, as you engage with CNX, we're just recording our time and you get a bill at the end of the month for the hourly rate. You can also, a different way to engage in CNX is just to have CNX do turnkey applications for you. So if uh, we have customers where they say our staff is too busy, we love Valence, but the staff is too busy, you know, we need CNX to do this for us 100%. So then we also do that. We analyze all the requirements. We do all the app engineering and deploy and everything. So there's many different ways to engage with CNX. And now we'll take the questions. I'm going to just uh, take a moment here to we'll start looking through the questions in my go to uh, webinar control panel. And uh, please, if you have not uh, submitted a question or if you, you still have time to submit a question as I start reading through these. Okay, let's see. So the first question we have is, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so the first question is, this thing is fabulous, what is the cost? Okay, well, the, uh, there's, no, there's no mystery on the cost. The, the cost starts at $15,000. Uh, that'll give you the Nitro App Builder, everything I showed you here, the valence portal for deployment and everything. That's for one IBM I serial number, one partition, and the price sort of goes up from there. If you have multiple partitions, it gets cheaper as you go adding more partitions. Um, but uh, you know the starting price is, is fifteen thousand dollars. That's right on our website, and uh, I would encourage you to request a, uh, a formal quote for whatever your configuration is, just so there's no ambiguity and you understand what the price is. Uh, next question is, 
okay, how can I try this on my system? Okay, so how you would try Valence and Nitro App Builder on your system is very easy. I'm just going to go back to my browser really quick here. And I'll go to, C this is CNX's website, so you can go to cnxcorp.com. And you can read a lot more about Valence as well. And uh, there's a lot of videos that you can watch on the resources page. Um, but to answer the question first, you just go to our downloads page here, and you would click download. You put in your email address, you get the download. This installer is extremely simple. It may take about 10 or 15 minutes from start to finish, to, and it'll do everything for you remotely. And then when the installer is done, you just you can log into Valence and you can see all those Nitro app examples and do everything that, that I just did here on this, on this webinar on your own system and even using your own data if you would like. Okay, so that's that one. Okay, next question is, if I wanted to develop code manually with Valence, how would you do that? Okay, so we covered, this webinar was only for uh, covering Nitro App Builder, but uh, you know, you can develop apps for Valence in many different ways. Um, if, if you if you want to use Sencha EXTJS, you can do that. That's what the visual components uh, are designed with in Valence. All these visual components uh, come from a framework called Sencha EXTJS. So uh, we offer training classes in that framework, and you can develop those apps manually and then do the backend code in RPG with uh, our Valence RPG toolkit. And uh, you know, that's it. if you need to do more complex apps that Nitro App Builder can't do, that's sort of what we recommend, and we offer all the training classes for that. And I would encourage you to explore more of that on our, on our website or, or contact us for more information. Okay, let's take a look and see what we have more questions here. Can you update tables on the IBMI from Nitro App Builder? Excellent question. Yes, the Nitro App Builder is a true app builder. It is not just a business intelligence tool, although many customers will write business intelligent apps like the customer dashboard I did is sort of like a business intelligence app, right? It's for it's like a dashboard or displaying management information. But uh, yes, you can quite easily do update grids. You can, it has a form creator where you can design forms and you can update data with it as a full blown app. We call it an app builder. So it's for building, building applications. Also uh, to, to continue exploring that, I would encourage uh, attendees to this webinar to install Valence on their system by going through that download process I just mentioned and look through all of these sample applications. Um, one of them is a simple order entry app, which uh, is really interesting. You know, you can add line items to an order, you can update order header information, you can start a new order. That's a perfect example for how an application for how you would want to, uh, to update data. Okay, let's take a look at another question. Uh, what do these widgets and apps look like under the covers? Is there source and object code? web application, does it use the IFS to store app files? Okay, so essentially the, the question is, uh, you know, what's going on under the covers, <laughs> okay? So when you're going through Nitro App Builder and you're designing an app, you're really designing a configuration of an app that gets stored in a series of data tables that are included with Valence. Then when the user launches the application, that configuration is retrieved and the application is generated dynamically at runtime. There is no source code behind the application. It's, a, it's just a configuration. Um, so actually there's pluses and minuses to that. I mean, the minuses are you cannot go and take that application and extend it with manual coding. You're, you have to go into the Nitro App Builder and add, um, you know, you have to be stay within the confines of the Nitro App Builder. One of the things that we did not show in this webinar is that you can take, you know, I, I did mention it in the beginning slides where I said you could have a button, for example, that could call a special RPG process. There are many places within Nitro App Builder apps that you can specify an RPG program to do special tasks. So obviously in that RPG program, you fully control that piece of the source code, okay? Um, but, uh, the other parts of this person's question are, you know, are there source and object code stored there? Well, the source and object code are really just the Nitro app runner. There is an application that is a runner application, but there's no really user editable or develop, developer editor uh, source code there involved. 
Um, and uh, the final part of the question is, does it use the IFS to store app files? Well, the you know, valence stuff is stored in the IFS or on the valence library. There'll be a library on your system called valence 5.2 and an IFS path called valence-5.2 on the IFS. Everything is stored within there. Um, but one last thing I will mention is, remember earlier we talked about you can develop apps manually with valence. There's something called Nitro Autocode, which is a source generator, and it will generate um, applications for you that are simple inquiries over a particular file, and it will also do file maintenance applications. And many times when customers are doing applications manually, they will start with an autocode application that will give you source code on the IFS and an RPG program to start with, and then you can go into that code and edit that manually. I would highly recommend, though, that you contact CNX for training if you want to use balance in that manner so they can make sure you're doing it right. Okay, next, there's a whole bunch of questions here. We have, we have like four more minutes to our allocated hour, so we'll just keep on going answering questions. Let's see, can you talk about deployment of apps, widgets, et cetera, across IBM I servers? For instance, if we have a development test server and a production server, can I develop the app on my a development test server and deploy it to the production IBM I server? Yes, that's, that's actually a great question. And I'll just demonstrate really quick, you know, that you can go in, I'm gonna go into Nitro App Builder here and just show you <clears throat> that if I, if I go into an app, I can click export, okay? So if I click export, what that's gonna do is give me a save file that contains every single thing associated with that app, all of the data sources, all the widgets, and all of the, the behavior configuration. I can take that save file, move it to any partition or system I want, and then I can go over here and choose this import button in the lower right. And then I can import, choose that save file, and immediately have everything available there. Now that's, that's with the Nitro App Builder. If I am doing apps manually, then it just becomes wherever my source files are on the IFS or, or RPG, I can just move those you know, manually to any system I want and, de and deploy, them, deploy them there. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay. Okay, uh, all right, so somebody asks, <clears throat> is there a cost to existing customers to get the new release? No, there is no cost. Existing customers, if, if you're on this webinar and you're an existing Valence customer, there is no cost. You just download it, install it to your system. It can actually coexist with any previous versions of Valence you have running, um, and you would request a, a new key from CNX, and if you're on maintenance, you would just get a new key for Valence 5.2 at no cost. <clears throat> okay, we're coming up on the end of the time, uh, so we're gonna end uh, the questions there. And, uh, but before you go, I'm just going to come back to our little slide here and just tell you how to get more follow-up information. Call this up. So uh, if you have additional questions later on, or if you want a price quote for your existing configuration of your IBM I and partitions, please contact Ivona Barnish. She's our Director of Customer Relations. There's her email address. I'll leave this up for a couple minutes. And... Um, that's her phone number if, if you'd like to call her. Please reach out to Ivona and give her any more questions. We'd be glad to, to answer additional questions. I really appreciate everybody taking their time to uh, join our webinar today, and I look forward to talking to you again in future webinars, and uh, hopefully you like what you saw. Thank you very much.